Welcome to On The Rocks, the mining industry's leading podcast. I'm Jess, the head of new media from Prospector, and today we're diving into an innovative world where bourbon meets renewable energy. Yeah, you heard that right. Our guest today is Lewis Buck, the SVP of Public Affairs at Three Rivers Energy Partners. With decades of experience in natural resource management and global economic development, Lewis brings a unique perspective to the renewable energy sector. In this episode, Emily and Lewis discuss how Three Rivers Energy Partners is revolutionizing the distillery industry by turning waste into renewable natural gas and fertilizer. They explore the concept of regenerative agriculture and its potential applications in various industries, including mining. Before we jump in, are you in the mining industry and interested in joining Emily for an episode of On the Rocks? Or curious about getting your message in front of our diverse listenership? Check out prospectorportal.com sponsor to learn about sponsorship opportunities. Now let's dig into the episode with Emily and Lewis as they explore the fascinating intersection of bourbon, renewable energy, and sustainable practices. I am so excited to have you on today, Lewis. Welcome to On the Rocks. I can't believe it's been this long and I haven't had you on here before. So welcome. Well, thank you, Emily. It's great to be with you. Uh, we go way back. Uh, yeah. I can't believe your daughter's eight or nine already. And uh, right. great to see you again. Happy, happy to be here. Yeah, so excited to have you on. And as all of our listeners know, usually our episodes focus on mining with maybe a, a side of bourbon or whiskey, but for this episode, we're actually going to start with the brown liquor and talk about how you've tied in energy and water and agriculture into what is a really cool concept. Um, so I would I would love to just have you kick it off by giving us an overview of what it is that you're up to. It's fun. We've got a new, we call it a sizzle video, right? It's about 15 seconds that we're using and it's about regenerative agriculture, but we call it imagine a world that does not run out of bourbon. So that's what we call a sizzle <laughs> deal and it seems to be working. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, uh, our founders at Three Rivers Energy Partners were in the oil and gas space. Uh, mm -hmm. They had an energy uh, environmental services company in the, uh, with frack gas. And instead of trucking all of the produce water around and putting it, taking it out of the ground and putting it back in the ground, they figured out it'd be a lot more efficient to pump it around with above ground pipelines. And they made okay. a business out of that and sold it into one of the major oil and gas companies. So when they decided after that project to get into, to stay in the energy business, um, that we got pointed toward the renewable or alternative fuels parts. And you'll remember that was part of what uh, we looked at in, in other parts of the world as well, how to make energy yeah. in remote places. And it's important to the mining industry to have energy, whether it's right. heat, gas, uh, electricity particularly. So we've always been focused on that. And so they founded the Three Rivers Energy uh, about three years ago, uh, pulled a team together, uh, the first project we got on your point was Jack Daniels. Uh, Jack Daniels. Good one to start with. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You get Jack, you, 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 you've got a high card in your hand to start with. Yeah. So, uh, but if you think about it, Jack Daniels is off the road. It's not easy to get mm. to. Lindbergh is a small town and they're serviced by small infrastructure mm. and they needed to expand and expand in a sustainable way. Um, so we should, they could, there was not enough natural gas for their expansion, for their boilers and all of the energy intensity that you see at a distillery. Mm -hmm. So we were able to show up and find a, a relationship where they provide us their waste products, uh, feedstock, and we provide them the energy back. And it's been, a, been a huge success. Uh, then our second project was Jim Beam. So we got Jim and Jack, so about two thirds of the, two thirds of the brown liquor business. Uh, yeah. So all you we need now is Pappy, right? Yeah. All you need, well, we're working on it and we got some, <laughs> we got some clear spirits in other parts of the world too, uh, but I don't know much about blue agave yet. I know more about <laughs> corn, barley yeah. and rye. So they're, uh, you know, in what comes out of the digesters looks like gray water. It's called digestate. Corn comes in, corn fertilizer comes out. Nothing in the biology messes 
degrades the minerals, right? So the, mm-hmm. all the minerals that your world operates in, potash, phosphorus, sulfur, all the way down to zinc, just go through the biology, the biology process untouched. So I've got a, a nutrient rich uh, fertilizer coming out of the back. The only thing that happens, we turn organic nitrogen, the, the microbes and the bacteria in the tanks, anaerobic digestion, turn the organic matter into ammonical nitrogen, nitrogen instead of organic nitrogen. But I've got I've got exactly all the same uh, phosphorus, potash, sulfur again, all the way down to zinc and uh, higher, a little bit higher pH. So it's a really good for soil health. So not mm-hmm. only can we show up anywhere in the world that has plenty of cheap feedstock for us to mm-hmm. feed this beast. We can also put those nutrients back on the ground and do the whole regenerative ag thing. So we're, we're, uh, we're the largest renewable natural gas project we're aware of in the world. Wow. Uh, at Jack Daniels and uh, where Jim Beam's actually a little bit bigger than Jack Daniels on the RNG side. And, uh, we may be one of the largest, it takes about 25,000 acres of corn to sustainably recover and reuse the fertilizer nutrients. So we may, we're among the largest regenerative ag, which, you know, I'm about, uh, yeah. a lot of water is what that's about too. all that water moving around. So it's been, it's been fun and uh, it's been exciting and we're, I think we're making a difference and that's always a good thing too. So, so to walk it back for folks that may not be familiar with kind of how the, the chemical or the process part works. So you take, when you talk about the, the feedstock, I mean, mm-hmm. we would think of like, you know, mining feedstock, but you mean what's left over from the distillery, right? Sure. You mean like essentially the, the waste product that's left over mm-hmm. from making the bourbon, right? That's right. Uh, yeah. Corn comes into those distilleries. It's cooked. It's fermented. Everybody, I think, can envision what happens at the distillery. Mm-hmm. Stillage, whole stillage mm-hmm. comes out, uh, which can be dried down to cattle feed or it mm-hmm. can be trucked out liquid uh, and fed to cattle. Now, there's challenges feeding the liquid whole stillage, both as a uh, livestock ration from the animal science side, but it's also can be in a small watershed can be an environmental challenge as well. Mm. When the distilleries want it, I think it goes, you want to walk it back. Apparently during COVID and everybody's locked down, they started drinking hard liquor because like, <laughs> I know these, what I did. Well, I had already started, but my, it went up a little bit. Yeah. So it's, so we go meet with both of these distilleries in around 2021 and they're both talking to us about doubling their capacity in a sustainable uh, way. They literally were talking about doubling wow. and didn't have enough energy infrastructure to get that done. And so they wanted to do that in a sustainable way. So we get a portion of the whole stillage. There's still mm-hmm. the industry, a lot that goes to cattle. So we get the whole stillage. Mm-hmm. It's actually too hot for us. We have chillers on site because it basically comes out of the distillers. They boil essentially right at boiling, which is too okay. warm. So we get to run uh, anaerobic digesters and don't have to add heat. We have to have to let mm-hmm. it cool down some. So that's a big advantage in terms of the carbon intensity score. Mm-hmm. Some people like to say anaerobic digestion tanks are just, and you know I'm an ag guy, so they're just industrial cows. Corn yeah. comes in. <laughs> Cow has four stomachs, there's Uh enzymes and bacteria in each of them, Mm -hmm. and corn fertilizer drops out the back, right? (laughs) Right. All we really do is catch the burps and farts. So, uh, (laughs) and then... Which brown liquor has been known to uh, to elicit, hey, not, not just in cows. So yeah. We clean them up, clean it up, mostly strip out the carbon dioxide, which, by the mm-hmm. way, is food grade CO2, which we overlap on in the mining industry, too. Mm-hmm. So we've got food grade CO2 for the marketplace. We strip out the, the hydrogen sulfide is, like for both of us, uh, the challenge. So most of our capital intensity, uh, most of our cost, both capital and operation, are in our cleanup plant. So the biogas, the raw biogas uh, that these tanks produce, we clean up to pipeline quality and put it in the uh, interstate pipeline system. No different than putting a grid on uh, an electron on a grid. We put a wow. methane molecule on a pipeline grid. Hmm. So we really get paid for the commodity molecule, 
we get paid better uh, in a voluntary market. We don't have any government program or any government subsidy here. There are plenty of people that want to buy in a voluntary market the the emissions that we reduce because we're making natural gas that's not a fossil fuel. So that's very lucrative and pays for everything else we do. And we hope to break even or like make a little bit on the fertilizer. We, we sell the fertilizer at a deep discount, make it very convenient for farmers. So we're mm-hmm. great for rural communities at the same time. So that's really our three sources. Uh, one big industrial cow. And uh, uh, I think we can share some photographs of both of these projects and drone shots. They're, 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 yeah. they're large tanks. That's so cool. I mean, so when you think about when you talk about regenerative ag, then Lewis, like what, first of all, what is that for a bunch of, bunch of mining folks? What is regenerative ag and what is this type of project? You know, how, wh- why is this regenerative, regenerative agriculture? It's the same idea that you read about or, or hear from a circular economy, right? Mm-hmm. Waste not, won't not is all we're mm-hmm. really talking about. We don't manufacture anything any of the nutrients that are left in my fertilizer we recover them so all of that sulfur was already in the kernel of corn that we started with Mm. everything we're doing at the distillery and and on our side of the fence is biology right we're using uh, bacterias and and naturally occurring things if you think about it a swamp makes methane has a swampy smell right Mm -hmm. it's what we're doing and uh so regenerative ag just means the f- corn comes in, goes through our process. We put the resulting nutrients fertilizer on the ground. It grows more corn. The distillery buys the corn back. So it's that circular economy concept. Uh, that's not necessarily the same bushel of corn, but uh, and we can pr- we recover enough nutrients from the distilleries to fertilize about 25% of their corn demand. Wow. Right. So we, we re, yeah, so we recover a significant percentage. Uh, it, it's, it's natural. It, mm-hmm. uh, it's very, very good for soil health. Uh, we'll be working. It's, it's, it, it may be organic in certain situations. Uh, so anything you grow at the end of our pipeline, we've got a large watercress farm, uh, for the salad folks that, uh, we're working huh. with, uh, anything you grow at the end of our pipeline, as we say, can be differentiated for the marketplace, which, so that's great for farmers. You know, if there's folks right. out there that want to pay, the corn you grow with our fertilizer is low carbon form, uh, low mm. carbon corn. So there's a market for those folks too, to get a carbon credit on that. So mm. anywhere in that circular economy or as it ripples out, there's the opportunity to address your sustainability goals and monetize that value uh, that we all all seek for a you know more sustainable future. And so, does that make the the whiskey or the bourbon low carbon bourbon? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How cool! Yeah, we're reducing the carbon intensity score of the Jim Beam Distillery like fifty percent. Wow! So because we're we're taking their uh, they no longer dry the whole stillage. Uh, mm. They pass it to us as liquid. But yeah, we're really taking down the um, the carbon intensity scores of the whole process. That is, we we can capitalize this in the private sector with that carbon intensity score. So that's what creates the value, the green paper, if you will, yeah. the trades in the marketplace. So we can sign 20 year contracts uh, with global players that just mm-hmm. want to say they're supporting projects that lower the carbon intensity score. Uh, and that's how we finance these projects. I mean, that just seems, it's a very elegant solution, right? It, I mean, it, 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 yeah. It's no new technology, some new applications and concepts, like it's not wastewater, it's fertilizer, mm-hmm. let's get it on the cornfield. And my boss is our founders were not afraid of 20 mile pipelines out to get to corn country from these distilleries. There's a set of challenges with pop, building pipelines and easements, and mm. pe- it's people business again. But yeah. that's the boldness of our founders to to close that loop. We always go in and sit down and, and discover the problem we're trying to solve. Each of them, they sound very similar, but both Jim Beam and Jack Daniels and our other clients we're working with uh, all have uh, had a problem to solve. 
and we crafted our relationship with them and these technologies to uh, to solve that problem. How cool! And what about the local communities, like the farmers in the area? And I mean, how have you been working closely with them or the communities on what this means for them? We have, and there's mixed results. You know, as you know, with any natural resource production yeah. if you're opening a mine there's going to be folks supportive and folks not supportive mm-hmm. uh, we are really disrupting the distillery industry uh, mm. traditionally uh, all of it has gone to cattle feed out the mm. back uh, now so now we've got happy corn farmers less happy that there's difference but at this point in time with the cattle inventory down there's still more cattle feed in the industry than demand for it so some uh, of the so some people with, were upset because they were losing their cattle losing feed cheap supply. cattle feed oh yeah. i see okay but from the distillery's perspective there there was in some distilleries in some states more feed than cattle so their problem right. was their st- their storage facilities were full and nobody interested in feeding it. Uh, yeah. So there's there's as always there's challenges. Uh, mm-hmm. People hear natural people hear gas project and think it's going to blow up or something. Mm-hmm. These are tanks full of water, right? Mm-hmm. We have less. Uh, these are about 120 million dollar projects each of them. We've mm-hmm. got a, over a million decatherms of our in, nat- renewable natural gas at each project. That's roughly enough gas for 10,000 homes or 15,000 automobiles. It's a significant amount of gas. Wow. But we clean it up and we compress it and put it in a pipeline. We'll never have more gas on site than a Midwest farm with three or four propane tanks. Hmm. So we get it in the pipe, spin the meter, get in the pipeline, get it on the system. So we don't store another big advantage. We don't have to pay for storage. Mm -hmm. We... It's a very much a continuous process and we put it in a pipeline and it gets gone. So the public, you know, the public, once they understand uh, a major economic driver in their community, like a distillery that we've all heard of and the jobs it creates, and then they hear of 25,000 acres and 200 farm families benefiting from discounted fertilizer and maybe yeah. sell the corn back, you know, you can get the, the community officials and, local leaders there'll always be some folks that have you know uh impact from the projects but overall and the farther you get globally the better the uh consumers of these projects in japan and europe really really like the sustainability Mm. story that now comes with these products and yes corporate marketing is not missing out on that either (laughs) i'm sure I'm yeah. sure that's what, yeah, yeah. I've, I have yet annual, to see a low carbon. Report. We are okay. in their annual report. Yeah, but I haven't seen like the... low carbon bourbon ads yet anywhere though. It hasn't gotten to, or maybe it's just here. Well, apparently, because we could have done organic corn as well, but apparently mm. bourbon drinkers really aren't willing to pay a premium <laughs> for an organic label, organic. maybe on their salad, but not on their, yeah, but not there, there's bourbon. not a premium for a lot of greenness in the brown liquors, apparently, other yeah. than at the corporate level, right? <laughs> well, hey, but I mean, that's a, it's moving the needle a huge amount though. I mean, the fact that you can reduce the carbon footprint by that sizable and in a way that, again, isn't just bringing in a whole bunch of new non-sustainable business models and stuff. I mean, that that is so, so cool, Lewis. And I wonder, you know, for, of course, I always think about how can you bring something like this into mining? Like what, what could that look like? Could you do something like this in a large, like a mining community that had a large Mm -hmm. agricultural support base, like how and have power go to a mine or how might this work? You know, we, we both work projects together around the Mm -hmm. world where what I would was doing an agribusiness overlapped what you were trying to achieve in mining and minerals. Cause for one thing, you got to feed the, you got to feed the people feed doing the mining. Yep. And yeah. And a absolutely. lot of times those resources are in less uh, permissive places. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we can, we can bring the technology and again, it's just a tank. You mm-hmm. fill it up with water and you get bugs started to growing in it, the microbes, and it does the rest for you. So, we can build these projects anywhere there's 
plenty of resources. And typically, uh, you know, we can do things with sugar. Uh, anywhere there's ag residue, people are doing this with corn stover. They're doing it with wheat straw. They're mm -hmm. doing it with uh, all kind of energy crops, including uh, a regenerative ag project, again, would look like taking the fertilizer from the back, particularly the phosphorus. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. the phosphorus, we can drop the phosphorus out, which can be a huge environmental benefit in some watersheds hmm. near where you live, for example, yeah. and uh, uh, put it back on the ground. So we could dedicate acreage in a mining community to grow the energy crops that hmm. we then harvest and put in the tank to make the energy, if the energy is that high of value, and just hmm. do the, the cropping, design a cropping system to feed for the energy. Crops. Or we look for agro residue. Uh, now, if you had timber and uh, other kind of uh, forest residues, you'd use a different technology than what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. And uh, we both looked at those before too, paralysis and other things to make biochar and those kind yeah. of things. But for uh, any, you know, any, anywhere we can recover basically the sugar from mm -hmm. a living plant, we can uh, turn that sugar with anaerobic digestion into uh, methane. Fascinating. And what about the what about the water component, Lewis? Because I do know at heart you're a water guy. So there how does go. water how does water availability and the circularity of how you use the water how does that come into play? Particularly on uh, the kind of projects we just talked about in mining, the, if we had biomass, well, let's mm -hmm. call it a, a, a cane bagasse or something like that, or corn stover. Well, the first thing you have to do is hydrate it, right? Mm -hmm. Before it goes in our tank. So we have to get it to about 10% solids. That's 90% water. Mm -hmm. So for those kind of projects, we can recirculate the water back to hydrate the new feedstock. So in mm -hmm. that scenario, we can, under certain situations, like we're looking, uh, we have some projects in Mexico, whether recycling the water back to the distillery and reducing their water footprint is just as important to them as reducing mm -hmm. their carbon intensity footprint. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of water in Tennessee and Kentucky, moving it as fer liquid fertilizer out to cornfields, irrigating with it, reuses the water in a different way because we've got mm -hmm. plenty, if you want to put plenty in air quotes in this part of the world. In drier semi-arid parts of the world, we can fertilize, fertigate, fertilize or irrigate and reuse and relife that water. Another circular economy moving at the same time. So there is a lot of water. We got this business because uh, we said it's uh, because of our vision of regenerative agriculture and putting back on the land, the capital intensity to build a water treatment plant and clean it up and discharge to creeks and rivers. These projects don't work with uh, right water treatment plants. Now they can be part of a solution, but for these big projects. So all the water, uh, you know, if there were surplus water in a mining operation, for example, we could mm -hmm. use it to hydrate our feedstock mm -hmm. and recirculate or take it to dedicated energy crop plant, grown plantations, that kind of thing. So if there is waste produce water or non potable water, there's mm -hmm. opportunities for the mining industry and this energy uh, industry to work together and find the highest value use and reuse of that water resource as well. I am a water guy. Thank you for throwing that out. <laughs> I mean, I think especially that phrase that you use, you know, the highest value use, because that value can be very different, right? Depending on where you're, where you're working and the, the groups that you're working with. So you can adjust how this model works depending on where that value is really found. And if you, if they, let's say a mine tailings, let's say we've got some mm -hmm. acid mine drainage, let's say it might be high in sulfur, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. My farmers are buying sulfur now, right? Yeah. So I want the sulfur and I can mix it and dilute it and, and perfect mm -hmm. it, but phosphorus particularly. So uh, a lot of times there are, uh, we can, we can turn that problem that we see in a waste situation into mm -hmm. a balanced fertilizer for crop production. The other thing that we're seeing, when we talked about the fertilizer, particularly in the, in the farmers, uh, in the rural communities, uh, 
our our digestate is fertilizer is non-flammable non-toxic now yeah if you dump it all into the creek at one time you'll probably have mm-hmm. a fish kill but it's not flammable it's not particularly toxic uh so we're working with the volunteer fire departments to put anywhere we run a pipeline out into a rural area we can have quick filling station you know hydrants to fill up their uh, brush mm-hmm. trucks to get quicker response to wildland fires uh, now, oh, that's cool. but, uh, that is cool. So uh, we work with railroads, which mining has a lot. So we we just signed an easement uh, with some railroads to just lay our pipe along mm. the base of their ballast, uh, mm-hmm. which is a nice straight level line. And yeah. uh, so we'll send fertilizer down beside the rails and they have the opportunity to bring the corn back on rails. And we got a shuttle train going both ways. Another great option, you, you've always got rail and a lot of those mining projects as well. Yeah. So whether we use a shuttle train with tankers, whether we incorporate rural fire protection, uh, or whether we, so there's a lot of ways uh, technically and socially to, to find that highest value use of those, those that water resource, because it might be fire protection. And yeah. uh, for example. How do you, how do you all as a team go through that process of figuring out what the highest value usage or these different kind of add-on components that really brings the true value of the project to the community. Like, how do you go through that in order to figure out what you should be doing? Because I never would have thought of that, like fire prevention, like adding, you know. It it starts with uh, the culture that our founders have created. Again, we're a three-year-old company. Uh, we've got about 30 employees now and, and several big projects and we're well financed. Uh, mm-hmm. But it starts with listening very carefully to the problem the client and really in our cases, the partner needs to solve, right? Whether it was, there's not enough natural gas in the pipeline for us to do our expansion or there's so much water, uh, we can't get a permit, whatever it might be. And then our team and the group of people uh, that, uh, on, in our company are fairly innovative. We all bring a little bit something to the, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm the guy that says that's, that's not wastewater. That looks like fertilizer to me. Right. And that's a game changer right there. So we've got some folks like that on our team that once we understand the puzzle we're trying to solve, Mm. uh, we go to work and we're, we're small enough and agile enough. Uh, and creative enough and bold enough or crazy enough uh, <laughs> or too much brown liquor enough to, uh, <laughs> to wonder, well, why, why not? Right. So we yeah. have been, been uh, creative on your, on the fire protection. We were working with the railroad to see if we could use their easement. And mm-hmm. there's often sparks, hot bearings, chains dragging, uh, oh, and they yeah. start fires up and down so but just the fact that we were wanting to lay something that sounded like a water pipe parallel to their railroad they go could we use that for fire suppression oh, so and it was the go, railroad actually that thought about it wow. because because and then of course we're at yes we can is going to be the answer to that and yeah. then figure out how yeah. to do it because uh, now there's a lot of rural fire departments uh, mm-hmm. you know happy to support our project so that's just how you talk to people, you listen, you interact, you're small and agile enough. Uh, if, if Mr. Rivers says, yes, he'll pay for it, then we can do it. Right. So yeah. Yeah. it's not that undifferent than the task force we worked on once in terms of a small group of subject matter experts having the agility and flexibility to try to solve some pretty hard problems. It's a lot of fun. It is. And I think, I mean, it's also in my mind, the value of having a team from, from like diverse backgrounds, right? Cause I'm, yeah. I'm sure you all see these, what, what the kind of customers or partners see as a problem. You all see it from different angles and you come up with solutions that if it was just an ag. Yeah. We have an ag, I'm the ag engineer, right? Yeah. Environmental engineer. We've also got an aeronautical engineer. So how do you get from oh, aeronautical right. engineering yeah. to biology in a tank, right? Yeah. But he, he built us a mobile digester, a pilot facility that allows us to put it on site and wow. let people come in, see it, smell it. We actually get make the fertilizer, get it lab. So in terms of communications and community outreach, and we're able to park it on site with our logo on the side and mm-hmm. actually 
to perfect the process and build trust and communications through that uh, mobile digester. That's mobile anaerobic <laughs> digester acronym MAD because it's it I was going to say there's got to be a there's got to be an acronym on that. Yeah. Man, mobile anaerobic digester because it gets upset every now and then. So, uh, <laughs> but, so our aeronautical engineer, you know, put that together, and it's the only one really in the industry that way. And it's been a highly valuable tool uh, for marketing and communications, and just um, mm -hmm. making sure our numbers are right Very and that cool. the project cash flows. Yeah, yeah. that's always yeah, that's always yeah. a bonus. Right? Always, that always helps. <laughs> So where do you think you all are going to go next? Where where would you love to see this technology take off? We continue to, to operate primarily in the agribusiness space. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking to folks in the sugar industry who have a lot of ag residue called bagasse piled mm -hmm. up in places. Looks great to us to, to do the regenerative ag back on their crops as well. Everyone's a little different. Everyone has mm -hmm. different challenges. To use a, a gas or a biomass is a different process because of the fibrous nature of it and the water resources part of it uh, mm -hmm. and the energy it makes. So it makes the corn makes a lot of energy uh, behind the distilleries. Uh, it's very consistent, very, very consistent, right? Because Jim Beam and Jack Banyan, they don't change their recipe, which right. is great for us to make gas because they can sign a 20 year contract. The bankers go, chances are Jim, those distilleries aren't going broke. So we can right. do long-term 20-year contracts with very consistent variables. Uh, okay. But we're looking hard at uh, others because we have those those two corporate partners everywhere they go from tequila mm -hmm. to, to uh, everywhere both of those go, we're looking at. Uh, but the sugar industry is interesting to us. Uh, we have not got into biosolids behind mm -hmm. uh, human wastewater, same process. Yeah. You know, we're going to we're kind of happy in our space right now before we take yeah. on that one. But the technologies, uh, anaerobic digesters are at every wastewater treatment plant. In the past, they've just flared off the gas. We've all seen that flare. Mm. Right. Yeah. Because people around the world are willing to pay for less emissions voluntarily in Europe with the, 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 they have to do it because of the stick in America and other places. We do it because of the carrot. So we have mm -hmm. voluntary contracts and people paying us a number we can both live with uh, on the carrot side of that for these green attributes. So you won't see, if you see flares at our places, we're losing money. So that's okay. the difference that it's been around a long time as a waste treatment technology. Uh, we're using the exact same tech with a profit motive mm -hmm. because the market has valued that reduction in the carbon intensity score. And is there like a scale threshold, Lewis? Like I know you mentioned how much corn it, you know, it takes to do this, but um, is there a scale at which you have to have enough volume for this to make sense or enough of a demand um, for the product on the other side? Yes. Just like any chemical engineering, any chemical plant, anytime you're pumping things with pipes, there's a scale there. Mm -hmm. There could be a situation on an island uh, there could be a situation where the energy is so expensive that uh, it works, right? So we come back to all of our projects currently at a fairly large scale because to clean it, the part that's most expensive is to clean the biogas up to pipeline quality because you have mm. to strip out the hydrogen sulfide and CO2 and all those things to get to almost pure methane going in the pipeline. So that's the expensive part. Mm -hmm. And when you press and you pump and you have filters, that's where the economy scale has to show up. You okay. can kind of downsize everything else to meet the, uh, meet the problem definition. It works mm -hmm. at very small scales. There are hundreds of these projects in Europe where they put food waste from town and actually harvest crops and take livestock waste and make the, make the regionals electricity behind these anaerobic there's like 400 projects i can uh, readily available in europe at a very small community scale to just uh and a lot of our landfills uh, have been tapped in recovering the methane from landfill gases in america so and a lot of the companies we compete with and work with 
uh, they've tapped all the gas that's pretty much available from landfills. Uh, mm -hmm. They've harvested that and they were looking to get into other other sources and we've uh, competed with them and worked with them to get these intentionally built projects mm -hmm. to use a different waste source for the energy. So that yep. it, but they're mostly larger scale. We're, we're about 120 million in both of these projects. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the scale that uh, we're about, you know, half a million gallons a day of uh, feedstock if it's liquid. Wow. So there's a lot of water. Yeah. So it's more of like in a mining terminology, you'd kind of want to be in like a mining district, probably mm -hmm. like something that size. Well, you're not talking about a small, small, like independent project that's away from a lot of folks, but maybe if, if there's a group of mining companies in a district together, something like this would make sense. If you have a, have a mine that has particularly high or you're worried about hydrogen sulfide, right? Okay. Uh, there's a, there might be opportunities to uh, pull that out and run it through mm -hmm. our gas cleanup plant, right? And, mm -hmm. and turn it into, you can use biogas, but it's so, the H2S makes it so corrosive that you'll, uh, you'll corrode a cat gin set. Um, a lot of digesters are on dairy farms, but if you run the clean biogas through a gin set, the gin set won't last long because that hydrogen mm -hmm. sulfide. So the capital intensity is cleaning that up to, to having more pure natural gas. Then you can run your trucks on it, right? Send your mm -hmm. trucks. So regenerative circular economy could be send the trucks right back, refuel the trucks with the methane, uh, mm -hmm. lower their carbon intensity score too, getting away from diesel fuel, or run elect electrify everything with the, but it works better and you really need to clean it up to pipeline qualities, not have the raw biogas. And that's where the scale effect comes from. Gotcha. Otherwise, otherwise it scales up and down just depending on the finance and economics. Sure. Well, with that, I'll, I'll be interested to see if you've got an answer for this. We asked all of our guests on the rocks, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the mining industry, what would you change? About the mining about? industry? Yeah. But maybe you could do one on the ag industry instead. Shake it up. One thing bit. that we're doing, we work with the largest uh, limestone company in the world, LAWAS, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of opportunities. Of course, agricultural lime changes the pH primarily, right? But they use a lot of pro you know, hydrated lime, quick lime, and that's a very that has a lot of agricultural applications. <coughs> we're working with them. Uh, to manipulate our digestate uh, as fertilizer. So uh, uh, that's an opportunity to actually work more directly with a mining company to, again, purify, change chemically, uh, recover phosphoruses and other things like that uh, with the mining company. So there, there may not be, I would just say to the mining industry, uh, Take a, take a view from 10,000 feet. If, if we're co-located in the same region, there's opportunities, synergetic opportunities to work together, whether it's in making a commercial product from our digestate by mm -hmm. adding, because again, I'm recovering the minerals uh, and whether it needs to be uh, more or less, right? Or changed. Uh, mm -hmm. But if certainly if there's mine water, a lot of it goes to engineered wetlands and that kind of thing. We can certainly work together on moving the water around. That's clearly where our founders started in the oil and gas business and uh, uh, pumping that water around and, and dealing with that water in a smart way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lewis. I really appreciate it. And Welcome. I'm looking thank forward to, to buying some low carbon bourbon or whiskey soon so you, you our clients insane. will guarantee will taste exactly the same right? <laughs> we'll, we'll taste exactly the same they will guarantee it uh, you there can you feel go. better you can consume more and there have the same go. climate yeah. impact <laughs> <laughs> and have a world what was what was the phrase you used at the beginning a world, a world that never has to... imagine a world that doesn't run out of bourbon there you go. Absolutely. I guess I'll just say whiskey to cover umbrella over both of my <laughs> clients. Right hey, it's great to see you again. Thank you for the opportunity to tell our story on your podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks, Lewis. You're welcome. Thank you for 
joining us for On the Rocks. If you love the show and are looking to partner with us, we have great news. We're now accepting sponsorships for On the Rocks. Interested in becoming a sponsor or making a guest appearance? Get in touch with us at prospectorportal.com sponsor. See you on the next episode.